So I just got done reviewing the Ryzen 7 5700X, and I was really impressed by that CPU. And today we've got something that may be even better, depending on what you need the CPU for, and that is the i5-13500, which for me personally, I'm calling it the jack of all trades, master of value, because it's just that good. It can do video editing absolutely fine. It can do gaming fine. It can do budget fine, and it can do efficiency fine, which out of the box, it's tuned for 4.4 gigahertz all cores. Though if you do put a better cooler on, at its uh, wattage limit of around 123 watts, it'll actually clock up the CPU to 4.5 gigahertz all cores. Though first thing is first, let's look at the gaming numbers, then we'll talk about all the intricacies with this king right here. Never pay full price for Windows 10 or 11 again. With today's video sponsor, SCD Keys, you can get activated for as little as $15 using that coupon, BFTYC. Links in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City, and straight away with the i5-13500, we actually have a similar core makeup to the i5-13600K, in that we have six P cores, and they extend to 12 threads, and then we have an additional eight E cores, which is also an extra four E cores over the i5-13400. Now, you also get an included box cooler, and it's coming in with a much better price point than the i5-13600K, and it's also coming in with a little higher price point than the i5-13400, for example, which makes it on the surface extremely good value for money. However, there is one key difference, and that is you do get less uh, CPU cache memory on the i5-13500 versus the i5-13600K. Though we have tested it in three different scenarios here today, the first being on a 60 USD motherboard with DDR4 memory at 3600 megahertz. This is the base case scenario for someone who wants to go on a strict budget with this CPU and the box cooler. And here is where you will get really good gaming performance and there was no detriment to performance if you're going down this route. I also decided to throw in 4,800 megahertz on a B760, as well as 6,000 megahertz on a Z690. So there's different memory speeds thrown in the mix here to help you out with a purchasing decision if you want to get this CPU. Though, first things first, we'll go into Horizon Zero Dawn, where we also tested this with an RTX 4090. And the reason I do this is to show the max theoretical differences. Now in 2023, there is so many good choices on the CPU front. I think competition is rife here. It's a really good time to buy a variety of different CPUs. There's a lot of choice depending on what your needs are. Though back to these games, three different resolutions across four games, which really, for me personally, paint all the information that I need to give a solid recommendation. First off, Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a game that is very CPU heavy. And here's where the DDR4 results actually came in with higher numbers than the DDR5 results on 4800 megahertz. The DDR5 6000 then beat out those lower clocked speeds, but the FPS was over 200 FPS in all scenarios, which is really good to see because this CPU is clocked lower, it uses less power than its other Intel counterparts, and it uses similar power to say the Ryzen 7 5700X. Even though it costs a little bit more, it does have higher productivity numbers. Though we'll talk about that a little bit later, going through the 1440p numbers and 4K numbers, the differences between the CPUs are mitigated and the 0.1% lows, that's the worst case FPS, is good in all scenarios. Though on the CSGO, this is where the, again, DDR4 numbers performed better than the DDR5 4800 megahertz, and then the DDR5 6000 megahertz performed better than the DDR4 numbers. So DDR4 seems to be the best value for gamers on a budget with this game, as well as Horizon Zero Dawn. Though moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, here is where we've got the advantage thrown back to AMD. So really depending on the game, AMD and Intel are gonna trade blows and DDR4 beat out DDR5 4800 megahertz in this particular title, then the higher clock DDR5 beat it out again. Though onto Cyberpunk 2077, the last game that we're throwing up here, here's where DDR5 4800 finally scored a victory over DDR4 3600. And then when we put in DDR5 6000, this game absolutely loved it. So basically if you're playing Cyberpunk and you want the best FPS for Cyberpunk, maybe you're playing it competitively, I 
I actually don't know if there's a competitive scene for Cyberpunk, but if you want the highest FPS possible in this game, then you will want to get the best DDR5 memory. That's something I learned from these tests here with the i5-13500 here today. Now the final metric we are showing here is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 1080p low settings, and here is where we've got the power consumption numbers. And also I decided to try undervolting, and I do put quotation marks on try because we're gonna talk about that right after this graph, where here's where we can lower the power consumption a little bit, as well as put that 4.5 gigahertz clock in even with the box cooler. Now, that's a pretty important point because what we're seeing here with this CPU is out of the box, it comes programmed for 4.4 gigahertz all cores, though it really is a 4.5 gigahertz all core on the P cores, at least the performance cores, CPU. So it's good that you can get an extra 100 megahertz out of this thing, especially for gaming and productivity. So with 13th gen, Intel have completely locked out undervolting where it doesn't matter if you lock in say minus 200 millivolt in the BIOS, it's going to do nothing. Intel's gonna automatically then say, okay, we're setting the minimum threshold here to say minus 30 millivolts. And so it'll do a very slight undervolt, but then nothing else will happen. So here's where we locked in minus 100 millivolt, but that didn't really lock in, but we got a slight undervolt. And so this ultimately does help a little bit, but basically when it comes down to it, even if you have an option in your BIOS to unlock the undervolt protection, it does nothing on 13th gen. As opposed to 12th gen, I actually found you could get some really good results from undervolting, especially for instance, the i9-12900K. But on pretty much all 13th gen CPUs, you can just go into the BIOS, drop in say minus 50 millivolt, call it a day, and that's going to be your undervolt. I mean, if you guys want a full tutorial on that, I can do it since I do have to still do an NVIDIA undervolting tutorial too, but this seems to be the way companies are going now, perhaps, and you, if you're asking me for a reason why this is, I would say maybe just a theory, I would have no certainty here, maybe it's a way they can upsell motherboards and help out the motherboard partners. Because what's the point of going out and spending $250 on a motherboard when I can go out and spend $100 on a motherboard and get a better result, especially for me in the long term, saving power from the wall. Though summing up the gaming results for the i5-13500 did extremely well. Its efficiency out of the box especially is really good. And then DDR4 is gonna be still your best value for money, not just on the DDR4 itself, but also the motherboard side too, when you factor in all those costs. And now it's time to move on to some quick productivity numbers. Here is where we've got Cinebench R23. So basically, if you're looking for great value when it comes to productivity, the i5-13500 is going to provide that. Then we move over to Firestrike Physics. Did extremely well here too. And then the last benchmark is Adobe Premiere Pro. If you are editing videos, definitely turn the iGPU on, which is an advantage that the i5-13500 has. And this is gonna give it some really good results in rendering videos, especially if you are into Premiere Pro. Also Intel's iGPU currently does have more functionality than say AMD's Ryzen 7000 series iGPUs. So if you wanna use QuickSync for encoding, for example, or you wanna use external displays via Thunderbolt, the i5-13500 can do that too. And now that we've presented all those numbers, it's time to give you guys a conclusion on the i5-13500. And all I can say is what a phenomenal value for money CPU. It's so relevant in all fields, whether you wanna get into gaming or if you wanna get into productivity, or if you just want to say, get something that's efficient, use the included box cooler, which doesn't do too bad of a job. So we'll also have a video coming up on how Intel have also improved the 13th gen box cooler over the 12th gen box cooler. And it's actually usable now and so if you wanna say save some money on getting a cooler, you can do that for the time being. You can also couple it in with a cheap $60 motherboard and DDR4 memory, and you've got yourself an extremely budget video editing rig on top of an extremely budget gaming rig. So this thing is just more choice for the individual, and it's an excellent choice in my opinion. If you get this thing, you are gonna have no problems at all doing anything you want on a single end desktop solution. Now, I think the biggest question you may have is, do I get this or do I get the Ryzen 7 5700X or say a Ryzen 5 5600 or even a cheaper i3 12100 or even last gen's 12400? And I think that comes down to what GPU are you getting? And so if you're getting something like an RTX 3060 or an RX 6600, you can just save a bit of money and get a Ryzen 5 5500 or an i3 12100 and if you wanna play on that for a few years to come, 
then just keep that money and wait until the latest i5 13500 equivalent is available in a few years. You'll be getting better value for money there. So here's where if you want to say get a used RTX 3090 or you find a good deal on a RTX 3080 or a 6800 XT, then the i5 13500 is going to be a great choice to couple in with that, especially if you want to double down on top of playing games and have a CPU that'll be great for work as well. Say for instance, if you want to edit videos. Though to answer the question directly, Ryzen 7 5700X or i5 13500, which should you go for specifically? Now, when it comes to gaming, you're gonna save, at least from the free market pricing that I can see right now, you're gonna save around $80 going with the Ryzen 7 5700X, which is a huge difference in price. But that being said, the Ryzen 7 5700X doesn't include a box cooler. So you'll have to add $20. So that's a difference of at least $60, which is still really large. You can put that toward your motherboard or your graphics card, for instance. So if you're a gamer and you want to get really good results right now, I would go for the 5700X for gaming. However, let's look at those productivity scores. And here is where the i5-13500, not only does it score a lot better there, but it's also much more versatile in that you can take advantage of the iGPU and say so you can use quick sync, it's gonna do better for streaming, and you've got those e-cores there which are going to do better in things like Adobe Premiere Pro. So if you do have a focus on productivity, which I personally do here at Tech Air City, I'd pick the i5-13500. If you're more focused on just gaming, Ryzen 7 5700X is going to be better value. Hope that answers that question if you're wondering which is the better of the two. Though as for the i5-13500 versus the 13600K, that's a different story altogether. Are you looking for maximum performance? Because you're going to get that with the 13600K. But if you're looking for better value, then the i5-13500 just beats the 13600K in every metric, especially when it comes to the power consumption because it uses a lot less power, you can couple it with inexpensive B760 motherboards and you're going to get that box cooler included and you're gonna save money off the face value of the CPU. So it's coming in with some really hard hitting value, which makes it a better choice for most people I feel going forward with the i5-13500. And with all those numbers aside, I hope you enjoyed today's benchmark comparison and review of the i5-13500. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button and also let us know in the comment section below if you were going for a new CPU, which would you go for and why? Love reading those thoughts and opinions as always, just like this question of the day here, which comes from Karasim88. And they ask, can you do this with the new 7950X3D? Please answer. And so they're referring to the video that we did where we took the 7950X and we dropped the temperatures significantly as well as the power consumption. Put the link to that video up here. Now with the 7950X3D, I am getting it in. So I will be running a variety of tests. And hopefully if you guys wanna see me uh, fine tune the X3D, then I'll try and do that. So I can make that happen in a dedicated video. Anyway, hope that answers that question and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you stayed this far, as always, and you're enjoying that tech guest content, you wanna see it the moment it drops, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.